uh, Khalil in, in, oh, okay, good. <laughs> so we, we have a recording. Um, uh, interactions and, and how, uh, uh, and uh, with an emphasis on neuroglial uh, interactions in health and uh, oncological disease. Um, and so her lab studies are uh, how neural activity regulates healthy glial uh, precursor cell proliferation, new, new oligodendrite generation and adapted myel myelination. Um, and her lab discovered that neuronal activity similarly promotes progression of malignant gliomas, driving glioma growth through both paracrine factors and through electrophysiology uh, functional neuron to glia synapses. And so it's fantastic how discoveries from her lab go from fundamental and basic um, description of molecular phenomena all the way to clinical trials apply, applied to uh, treating disease. Um, and so her work has been recognized with numerous uh, honors. I don't have the time to go through them, but between them, an NIH Director's Pioneer Award, a MacArthur Fellowship and election to the National Academy of Medicine. And so I really welcome Michelle today at our series. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk today. So the stage is now yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sita, for the wonderful introduction. It's so nice to, to join you and to be part of the seminar series. Thank you so much for joining us. Broadly speaking, um, my laboratory seeks to understand the molecular language that cells use as they work together to build and to remodel the brain and, and how those interactions interface with um, the immune system. Um, and I want to tell you one story today in two parts about the way in which neurons interact with the glial cells that form the myelin sheath during development, and, and we now understand in an ongoing, modulatable way throughout life, um, how this kind of adaptive and experience-dependent um, changes in the myelinated infrastructure of the nervous system um, contributes to cognition and various other neurological and neuropsychiatric functions. And then how these really powerful interactions between neurons and glial cells are hijacked and subverted in the context of glial malignancies. And while I'm going to talk about the interactions between neurons and primary brain cancer cells, I, I really want to emphasize throughout the talk, and, and we'll focus on this at the end, that these interactions between the nervous system and cancer are at play throughout cancers throughout the body, that, that you know, the, the principles of um, cancer neuroscience that we'll talk about within the nervous system are very much at play outside of the, the central nervous system between the peripheral nervous system and um, a range of different kinds of cancers. But since we're focusing on neurodevelopment first um, and, and you know, broadly focusing on neurodevelopment, I find that the best way to do that is to show you pictures of my children. <laughs> so this is my daughter, Sophie. Um, when Sophie was an infant, we realized there was so much neurodevelopment that humans undergo every single day in the first year of life that we needed to uh, make her a checklist so that she could keep up with all of her neurodevelopmental to-dos. Um, and, you know, being an infant, the best way to, the best place to put that was on a onesie. <laughs> so we made her this onesie. Um, and, you know, it really is just astounding how much neurodevelopment human infants accomplish every single day in the first year of life. For example, um, humans make something on the order of 500 billion synapses every day in the first year of life, uh, 14,000 new hippocampal neurons, 127 million or so uh, cerebellar granule neurons every day in the first year of life. But perhaps the biggest task, as impressive as that is, perhaps the biggest task that humans have in the first year of life and well beyond is to myelinate their central nervous system. Myelin um, development is chiefly a postnatal developmental process. It does begin um, just before birth. When humans are born, there is a little bit of myelin really in the center of the brain around the central sulcus. And then over the first year of life, there's a massive wave of myelination progressing from that kind of central nidus towards the poles of the brain. Um, similarly, there's a, there's a pattern in the spinal cord of this initial pattern of myelination that begins in the cervical spinal cord and progresses down the cord um, towards the, the lumbosacral cord. But after that initial wave, myelination actually continues to develop 
for about three decades. Um, it's a remarkably protracted developmental process, more so in humans than even um, other non-human primates in an adjusted way. And although it is very protracted and we don't understand what regulates these really discrete waves of myelin development, it is clear that myelination follows predictable topographical and chronological patterns happening in certain parts of the nervous system at certain ages. And, and in general, this developmental uh, myelination process that, that, that spans about three decades follows the rule that more basic neural circuitry, such as that that underlies sensation and movement, myelinates prior to myelination of higher, um, uh, more complex neural circuitry that underlies things like higher cognition. And so, for example, there's a discrete wave of developmental myelination in the brainstem in mid-childhood around the time that kids gain the ability to uh, ride a bike without training wheels, to, to skip with alternating feet and, and attain, attain multiple additional, you know, higher level uh, motor milestones. And then neocortex and intercortical association fibers, so important for higher associative cognitive function, they're is a discrete wave of myelination in those regions in adolescence and young adulthood. And so this process of myelination, the process by which an oligodendrocyte precursor cell will generate a new oligodendrocyte that ensheaths the axonal membrane to decrease transverse capacitance and increase the speed of neural impulse conduction down the axon. It doesn't end there, but actually, continues, particularly in the neocortex and, and its, its projections throughout life. And even in these historical lithographs, we see that uh, there's this accumulation of myelin over the lifespan in the neocortex. And this is fundamentally interesting because, you know, it's, it's fascinating how our, our nervous systems develop, but it is also really important to understand as we consider high-grade glial malignancies of childhood, young adulthood, and, and even beyond into older adulthood, because these brain cancers occur in very specific places at very specific ages. In fact, as a neuro-oncologist, if you tell me um, what age a child is and that they have a glioma, I can tell you where it is. It's very predictable. And it turns out that this spatiotemporal pattern of gliomagenesis maps pretty well onto the spatiotemporal pattern of developmental myelination, such that at a time when there is this discrete wave of developmental myelination in the ventral pons, this is one of, one of the worst human cancers, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, also recently renamed diffuse midline glioma of the pons tends to occur. And similarly, at a time when there's this discrete um, increase in myelination in the neocortex and its projections, this is when hemispheric high-grade gliomas of adolescence and young adulthood tend to occur. And this spatiotemporal pattern is concordant with discoveries from my laboratory and from many others that the cell of origin for many forms of hybrid glioma turns out to be in the oligodendroglial lineage, either bona fide oligodendrocyte precursor cells, just earlier pre oligodendrocyte precursor cells or OPCs, um, or less differentiated but somewhat lineage committed stem cells, and certainly fits with the molecular characteristics of these tumors, um, which contain very important subpopulations that very closely resemble oligodendrocyte precursors. And so we may glean really important lessons uh, about gliomagenesis by better understanding what normally regulates this process of gliogenesis. And, and that begs a very, very basic question. What does regulate an oligodendrocyte precursor cell? What regulates its proliferation and functional differentiation into these myelin-forming glial cells? Well, one hypothesis that had been in the literature since um, the early 1990s, first introduced by Ben Barris when he was a postdoctoral fellow with Martin Raff, is the idea that neurons themselves may be regulating the extent to which their axons are myelinated, and that this could be occurring in an activity and experience-dependent manner. This was a really controversial idea in the glial field for many years because they're also very clearly activity independent modes of myelination. If you put an oligodendrocyte in a Petri dish with any appropriately sized fiber, formal and fixed axons, inner you know, nanofibers, it will myelinate anything of the right size. And so they're clearly activity independent modes of myelination as well. Um, when I entered uh, the field and, and began my lab in, uh, gosh, a little over um, 11 years ago, 
uh, this is one of the questions that we really wanted to ask, that we really wanted to understand leveraging tools of, of modern neuroscience to, to probe whether in awake and behaving um, mammals, and there might be activity and experience regulated um, oligodendrogenesis. To ask the question of whether myelin might be plastic and adaptable. And so I'd like to focus the next um, part of the talk on this idea of myelin plasticity, of activity and experience dependent changes in um, the myelinated infrastructure. And to introduce you to some of the people in my laboratory who've led this work, this was work that was started by Erin Gibson. Um, she was my very first postdoctoral fellow. She's now an independent investigator, a professor here at Stanford. Um, this is Anna Garrity, um, who completed her postdoc with me and stayed on as a senior research scientist in my laboratory, very lucky for me. Uh, Juliet Knowles, who's a pediatric epileptologist who did her postdoctoral fellowship with me and is now um, also an assistant professor at Stanford. And Belgen Yalsen, who is um, a, currently a postdoctoral fellow and um, is actually hitting the job market this year. And what Aaron and Anna and many others in the laboratory have done is to, to take tools of modern neuroscience like optogenetics and uh, use this to probe the interaction between neurons and other cell types. And so as this audience probably knows well, optogenetics um, allows for targeted control of specific populations of neurons in particular places in the brain using light. And so here we're stimulating the motor planning or premotor cortex of a mouse um, that expresses channel rhodopsin 2, this blue light sensitive cation channel isolated from algae in cortical projection neurons. And then if we, if we deliver blue light at the surface of the brain over the motor planning area, the mouse executes complex motor behavior, which you know, if you're a mouse in a box, usually means walking in a circle. Um, this behavioral output tells us that we've successfully recruited activity within the circuit and then we can ask really straightforward questions about how other cell types within the stimulated circuit respond to this change in neuronal activity. And what we found now, um, goodness, almost 10 years ago, is that neuronal activity of cortical projection neurons, and interestingly, really quite specifically, corticocolosal projection neurons, not corticofugal projection neurons, elicits rapid and robust proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursors and pre-OPCs, if we deliver the thymidine analog EDU at the time that we stimulate these cell, uh, this um, cortical projection neurons, then we can fate map the, the proliferating cells over time. And we find that those OPCs do generate mature oligodendrocytes and that the myelinated ultrastructure of the circuit changes over time. And it changes in a way that we would predict might influence circuit dynamics, the speed of, um, of communication within the circuit and therefore influence behavior. And indeed, what we found was that over time, there was an improvement in motor functional behavior that depended upon the generation of new oligodendrocytes and these myelin changes. And so wanting to understand some of the molecular mechanisms that are mediating this communication between neurons and oligodendric glial precursors, um, we first tested the molecular hypothesis that activity regulated secretion of the neurotrophin, brain derived neurotrophic factor, um, signaling to one of its receptors, TREC B or NTREC2 on oligodendrocyte precursors, was an important component of this, of this mechanism. And we tested this using two different genetically engineered mouse models. And the first model, um, a model made by Mike Greenberg's lab at Boston Children's Hospital, um, there is normal baseline expression of BDNF, but this mouse has been engineered to lack the CREB binding site in promoter four of the BDNF gene such that, that there is no increase in BDNF expression and secretion in response to neuronal activity. So we have an, an activity uh, dependent BDNF increase deletion, if you will. In a second mouse model, rather than modulating the BDNF ligand, we instead modulated the BDNF receptor TREC B, just in oligodendrocyte precursor cells and in an inducible way so that we could induce this deletion in OPCs at various points of postnatal development or adulthood. And what we found was that when we optogenetically stimulated cortical projection neuronal activity in either of these genetically engineered mouse models, 
that the expected activity dependent increase in OPC proliferation that you see in wild type animals was completely lost in the absence of BDNF, of activity regulated BDNF or in the absence of OPC specific expression of TREC B. As there are no um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells proliferating, we also found that there were no new oligodendrocytes being made and accordingly no changes in the myelinated infrastructure. <clears throat> so while we think that the mechanism mediating neuron to oligodendric glial interaction is much more complex than just this one signaling axis, this was a required component of the mechanism, at least in cortical projection neurons. And that gave us a molecular handle to begin to understand what role these activity dependent changes may be playing in normal uh, neurological and neuropsychiatric function. And so using that strategy, specifically blocking activity dependent myelination, um, we and others in the field who've also you know, used uh, more broad strategies like simply blocking oligodendrogenesis in general, have identified a number of different um, important roles for activity regulated changes in myelin in a range of neurocognitive and neuropsychiatric functions, including um, motor function and motor learning, attention, memory encoding, uh, consolidation of spatial and fear uh, memories, uh, learning, uh, reward learning, uh, visual experience, et cetera. And we're really just beginning to understand the roles of um, these activity dependent changes in myelin. What's clear is that there's a couple different forms that these activity dependent changes can take. I've mostly talked to you about the generation of new oligodendrocytes from proliferating oligodendrocyte precursor cells. That, that those then form new myelin internodes in previously unmyelinated axons or previously discontinuously myelinated axons with available axonal territory for myelination. There's also really clearly remodeling of myelin by existing oligodendrocytes in an activity dependent way in which the myelin internodes either um, become longer or shorter, thicker or thinner. And either adding new myelin or changing the geometry of these myelin internodes can have subtle but really important effects on conduction velocity in that axon. And that can really change circuit dynamics. And the way that healthy activity dependent myelin changes circuit dynamics um, has been determined both computationally as well as experimentally to generally promote coordinated circuit functions, such as synchronizing the inputs from two different regions of the nervous system uh, to its target. Um, these, this kind of synchro syn synchronicity can promote synchronous oscillations between nodes within a neural network and generally promote um, better function in the healthy brain of these networks. And so as I've told you, Plasticity of myelin, which tunes neural circuit function, contributes to healthy attention, memory, and various forms of learning. It makes sense then that if there was a disease process that impaired myelin plasticity, that that may in turn impair cognition. And indeed, we found that um, there are a number of cognitive impairment syndromes, so-called brain fog syndromes, that exhibit deficient myelin plasticity and homeostasis. And one that I have studied for many years as a neuro-oncologist is the cognitive impairment that occurs after um, a range of different cancer therapies. Uh, this is a syndrome called cancer therapy-related cognitive impairment. It's characterized by impaired attention, memory, speed of information processing, multitasking, and executive function. And a very, very similar set of symptoms happen in, in other systemic illnesses. Um, most uh, prominently and, and uh, dramatically in, in, in the wake of the most recent pandemic, there's been a, a, a real epidemic of brain fog um, after even relatively mild cases of COVID. And as I'll summarize in the next couple of slides, we found that uh, myelin plasticity is impaired, uh, myelin homeostasis and plasticity is impaired in both of these brain fog syndromes because of um, neural immune interactions. So first, considering the, the cognitive impairment that occurs after traditional cancer therapies, and here we studied a very commonly used, commonly associated with brain fog um, chemotherapeutic agent called methotrexate. We find that methotrexate directly activates microglia, the resident macrophages in the brain, as well as other myeloid cells. 
these activated microglia then um, activate astrocytes, um, causing um, astrocytes to change from a homeostatic state to a more reactive state. And together, um, these um, reactive glia, microglia and astrocytes, impair myelin homeostasis and plasticity. If we target the microglia, if we deplete them experimentally using a small molecule inhibitor of um, a receptor called CSF1R, which is required for microglial survival, uh, that restores myelin um, oligodendroglial dynamics, it restores myelination, and it rescues cognition. I was really worried when the pandemic started that we would start to see a very similar set of symptoms in people after even relatively mild COVID because of how profoundly immunogenic um, this virus seems to be. And it was very clear really early on in the pandemic um, that that was indeed um, happening and, and has persisted as a major, major um, problem uh, following even relatively mild cases of COVID. And so wanting to study this, wanting to understand if um, respiratory infection can induce the same kind of microglial reactivity that systemic cancer therapies can. I reached out to Akiko Iwasaki, who's really been a, a thought leader in um, understanding the, the biology of COVID and asked uh, to, to study together a mouse model that her laboratory developed, uh, engineered to restrict COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 infection just to the respiratory system, because we wanted to test the hypothesis that the in immune challenge in the lung could result in inflammation in the brain. And so in this mouse model, it's engineered to express human ACE2, uh, the obligate receptor for SARS-CoV-2 um, infection just in the respiratory system. Then the mice are inoculated with SARS-CoV-2 intranasally. And while the mice in this model don't get very sick, they don't lose weight, they clear the virus in a week, the virus does not enter the central nervous system, there's no evidence of infection outside of the respiratory system. We still saw the same pattern of really prominent microglial reactivity, especially in the white matter, um, especially in axon tract microglia. This persisted, um, we, we examined these mice a week after infection and seven weeks after infection, and we found this persistent microglial reactivity even um, at seven weeks after the infection had cleared. Together with this microglial reactivity, just as we had seen in the context of um, uh, cancer therapies, we find that there is a, a impairment in myelin homeostasis with a decrease in the number of myelinated axons in the projections, um, projection axons from the cortex. When we compare the degree of um, myelinated axon loss after respiratory uh, restricted COVID in mice um, and after uh, high dose methotrexate, we see that there's kind of a commensurate loss of myelinated axons. And this loss of myelinated axons um, goes together with the persistent neuroinflammation and a loss of mature oligodendrocytes, um, which we're trying now to, to better understand and to understand if similar kinds of microglial targeting strategies may prove therapeutic in, in this um, context as well. So we think that myelin plasticity is really important for healthy neural circuit function and cognition. We know that um, in, at least in preclinical models that there is a loss of myelin homeostasis and plasticity in diseases of impaired cognition. What happens if there's too much myelin plasticity? What happens in diseases characterized by aberrantly increased um, patterns of, of neuronal activity um, to myelin? Could this process actually become maladaptive rather than adaptive and contribute um, to pathological circuit activity. This is a, a question that we've begun to ask first in um, syndromes of generalized epilepsy. And this is work that was led by Juliet Knowles in my lab. And the hypothesis was that with aberrantly increased neuronal activity, we may see aberrantly increased myelination. And maybe that will cause too much synchrony between nodes in a network um, and contribute instead to disease pathogenesis. When we look at um, mouse models and in rat models of um, generalized epilepsy syndromes like Absence epilepsy, and we did this work in collaboration with John Huguenard, we find that just as predicted after the onset of the seizures, 
we do see this increase both in the number of myelinated axons um, as well as um, in the, the thickness of the myelin sheet. These changes in myelin are specific to the seizure network. Um, we only see the increase in myelination within the, the seizure circuit. When we look outside of that circuit, we don't see changes in myelination. And these myelin changes depend upon the seizures. If we um, treat the mice um, you know, uh, anticipatorily and prevent seizures with um, effective anti-epileptic drugs, then the myelin changes don't happen in these mouse and rat models. And so the question is, does the aberrant increase in myelin actually promote further increased synchrony within the seizure network and therefore exacerbate epilepsy? Seizures are essentially diseases of hypersynchrony between nodes within the seizure network. Well, what we find is that if we use that genetic strategy I, I described earlier and prevent activity-dependent myelination by deleting the TREC B receptor from oligodendrocyte precursor cells, then um, in, these, in these mouse models, there is a decrease in the um, ictal coherence in the um, synchrony essentially between um, nodes within the seizure network. And you can see that plotted here. We would predict then that the worsening of epilepsy that happens as part of the natural history of these diseases over time might be mitigated if we prevent activity dependent myelination that promotes that hypersynchrony between nodes in the seizure network. And indeed, in mice in which we've prevented activity dependent myelination, either genetically by deleting the TREC B receptor or pharmacologically by, by um, using epigenetic strategies that prevent oligodendrogenesis, in contrast, um, to mice, mice with intact uh, myelin plasticity that have this increase in um, seizure burden over time. Uh, we find that in mice that have um, a deficient myelin plasticity, that there's not the same progression of the seizure severity, indicating uh, to us that the myelin plasticity after the seizure syndrome starts contributes to its worsening over time by promoting that hypersynchrony. So myelin plasticity plays roles in, in healthy cognitive function, can be deficient in diseases of impaired cognitive function, can, can conversely contribute to disease when it's um, aberrantly upregulated and be maladaptive. But what happens in, in brain cancers that arise from oligodendric glial precursor cells? Might the same really powerful interactions between neurons and glial cells be subverted in the context of glial malignancies like glioblastoma and diffuse midline gliomas? And so I'm going to focus the second half of my talk on this idea of malignant myelin plasticity, of activity-dependent glioma growth. And to introduce you to people who've really led this work, there are men in my lab, they just haven't uh, made it to these particular slides. Um, but I'd like to introduce you to the people who've done the majority of the work I'm about to show you. Um, this is Hamsa Venkatesh, who uh, was a um, uh, incredibly brilliant uh, cancer biology PhD student in my lab. After getting her PhD, she stayed on with me for her postdoctoral fellowship. So I really do feel like her academic mom. I take a lot of credit. Um, uh, she gets most of the credit, of course. Um, she is now an independent um, uh, assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. This is Ewan Pan, who is a wonderful postdoctoral fellow uh, with me, as well as um, with David Gutman at Wash U. She's now an assistant professor at MD Anderson. Katie Taylor and Tara Barron, who are presently both uh, postdoctoral fellows in the lab. And these are the diseases that as a pediatric neuro-oncologist, um, I, I think a lot about and that we think a lot about in my laboratory. These are glial malignancies of childhood, which as I mentioned earlier, happen in a very predictable spatiotemporal pattern. For example, um, the gliomas that arise, low-grade gliomas that arise in the optic pathway, very classically associated with the tumor predisposition syndrome called neurofibromatosis type 1 or NF1, tend to occur in early childhood. And here I'm showing you um, an optic pathway glioma in the optic nerve of a four-year-old. This is that really awful cancer that I mentioned before, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, also called diffuse midline glioma of the pons. As you see, this is a disease that involves the entire brainstem. It is diffusely infiltrative. There's no separation between the tumor and the normal tissue. This is a cancer that integrates into the nervous system. 
This is um, a very molecularly related uh, but clinically distinct uh, disease entity. This is a thalamic glioma, again, diffusely infiltrative, um, as you can see, involving both, both thalami. And then uh, in, in older children, young adults, and in older adults, um, the glio high-grade gliomas tend to be hemispheric in location. Um, this is a pediatric glioblastoma arising from the frontal cortex in an adolescent patient. And the idea that neurons might be interacting with glioma cells is actually something that a very um, brilliant uh, neuropathologist uh, in the 1930s uh, recognized. And then that sat there <laughs> until very recently. Um, but H.J. Uh, Shear um, described what he called secondary structures of shear, and we've, uh, as a field, renamed um, perineuronal satellitosis the propensity of the malignant glioma cells to cluster in very tight microanatomical association around mature neurons in the microenvironment, and then to invade along axons. And the idea that neuronal activity might be promoting glioma pathophysiology is something that, you know, I started thinking about as a clinical fellow, looking at um, images from my own patients and, and recognizing these, you know, secondary structures of shear, this perineuronal satellitosis, um, and thinking about how this close microanatomical association suggests that there might be an important signaling relationship between these two cell types. I want to point out that this particular h &E image comes from a five-year-old patient of mine at the time of his autopsy. He died from his uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma very quickly. And uh, he actually donated his brain to enable us to make the very first cell culture and xenograph mouse model of this kind of glioma. And it's really through similar such donations from patients and their families that we're able to do all of the work that we do. So I just want to acknowledge that incredibly important contributions from our patients. And so to test whether neuronal activity similarly increases the growth of glioma cells as it does the um, proliferation of normal glial precursors, we use that same optogenetic stimulation paradigm, stimulating cortical projection neurons in the premotor cortex, but this time in the context of a diffusely infiltrating cortical glioblastoma isolated from an adolescent patient of mine. And what we found is that when we stimulated neuronal activity, that just like their normal counterparts, the glioma cells increase their rate of proliferation. And that over time, this increases the tumor burden specifically within the stimulated circuit. So brain activity can promote brain cancer growth. Later on, we looked um, at low-grade gliomas, a different molecular class of um, glial malignancies, in collaboration with David Gutman's lab using um, a, a really um, tractable and, and uh, faithful model of um, NF1-associated optic pathway glioma that arises in the optic nerve and chiasm of mice at a very predictable time. We find that if we um, optogenetically stimulate the optic nerve just prior to the time of tumor initiation that the tumors that emerge are much longer than identically manipulated litter mate controls um, that had the fiber optic placed, but in which we didn't turn the light on to stimulate that. Now, this optic pathway glioma model is a really exciting opportunity to ask questions, not just about the way that um, neuronal activity influences growth, but also about initiation, because we know exactly when these tumors emerge and exactly where they're going to emerge. Also, this is happening in a circuit that we don't actually need optogenetics for. We can modulate optic pathway activity simply by modulating visual experience. And so we, we first tried to get the mice to wear these uh, sunglasses that didn't work well. And so instead we just put them in complete darkness. And, and what we found is that if we put mice in complete darkness to decrease visual experience, which we measured at these ages does decrease the activity within the optic nerve. If we do that around the time of tumor initiation or even just after tumor initiation, then the tumors that are evident uh, several weeks later at 16 weeks of age are far fewer and much smaller than litter mate control mice that were simply raised with normal visual experience with 12 hour light, 12 hour dark cycles, as opposed to 24 hours of darkness. And instead, if we put these mice in the darkness at six weeks of age, prior to the initiation of these tumors reliably at nine weeks of age, absolutely no tumors form 
even if we put the mice back into normal light cycles, restoring normal visual experience after what appears to be a critical period in uh, tumor initiation in this particular disease. So there's some powerful interactions that are ongoing now uh, between neurons and gamma cells. And we first hypothesized that there were activity regulated paracrine factors that may uh, be at play. And so to test that idea that there are activity regulated secreted factors that are modulating glioma activity, we did a simple set of experiments in which we took explants either from mouse cortex or from mouse retina and optic nerve. Then we collected the secreted factors in condition medium from those um, explants when the neurons in the explants were at various levels of neuronal activity, either spontaneously active, optogenetically stimulated, or in which neuronal activity had been silenced using the voltage-gated sodium channel blocker to trototoxin. And what we found is that when we took that condition medium and placed it onto glioma cells and culture, that there was an activity dose-dependent increase in glioma cell proliferation lost when neurons were silenced. Now, gliomas are a collection of molecularly related but distinct, clinically and molecularly distinct disease entities. What we find though, somewhat surprisingly, is that the response to activity regulated secreted factors is conserved across multiple different forms of both high and low grade glioma, including um, pediatric hemispheric glioblastoma, um, H3K27 and mutant diffuse midline gliomas, uh, IDH wild type um, adult hemispheric gliomas, IDH mutant um, anaplastic oligodendroglioma, and NF1 associated optic pathway low grade gliomas. So, what's in the condition medium? Um, through a couple years worth of biochemical and proteomic experiments that I'm going to summarize with a single text box as we do, um, we found that two really key activity regulated paracrine factors promoting glioma proliferation included, not surprisingly, brain derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, this um, just as it plays a, an important role in normal glial precursor cell proliferation, it also plays a role uh, here in glioma proliferation. But really unexpectedly, we found an activity regulated um, uh, leavage and secretion of a synaptic adhesion uh, molecule called neuroligin-3. Now, neuroligin-3 is a really interesting molecule, totally unexpected to find in this uh, somewhat unbiased screen. It is a well-known postsynaptic adhesion molecule um, that plays important roles at both uh, glutamatergic and GABAergic synapses. It regulates synaptic strength. Uh, but it was not known to be a mitogen in any context. And actually, it was not even known to be secreted. Um, but we find that neuroligin-3 is cleaved at the membrane in a strictly activity-dependent manner through the enzymatic activity of the metalloprotease atom 10. So the next set of questions was what cell types are you know, shedding neuroligin-3 in a activity-dependent manner. And when we look at neuroligin-3 expression, certainly neurons are a postsynaptic cell type that expresses high levels of neuroligin-3 but so are oligodendrocyte precursor cells. It turns out that oligodendrocyte precursor cells engage in both glutamatergic and GABAergic synapses with neurons. Now the role that those so-called neuron to um, glial synapses play in myelin plasticity is still something that we and others in the field are trying to understand, but they're very clearly there. And interestingly, we find that the major source of neuroligin-3 shedding in the healthy brain are oligodendrocyte precursors placing the OPC in the tumor microenvironment really for the first time and asking some very important questions about what role um, uh, these neuron to glial synapses and neuroligin-3 in particular might be playing in normal myelin biology, something that we're, we're trying to understand now. So the next set of questions um, uh, focused around the relative importance of neuroligin-3. We know that there are many cell intrinsic mechanisms by which glioma cells proliferate and grow, um, as well as numerous microenvironmental mechanisms. And I've just told you about a few here. Um, it is, uh, you know, a, a relatively straightforward um, question to ask um, in 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 this in this experimental setup by xenografting. Um, uh, different patient-derived cancer cells into the environment of either the neuroligin-3 wild type or neuroligin-3 knockout brain. 
And what we find when we do that is, is really unexpectedly that in the absence of neuroligand three from the tumor microenvironment, these tumors that we place there simply do not expand. Here you see these GFP labeled um, cortical glioblastoma cells growing in the cortex of a wild type mouse. Here are the tumors that we xenografted six months prior, but in the absence of neuroligand three in the microenvironment, they simply do not expand. And if we monitor that uh, using in vivo bioluminescence imaging, we see that this is conserved, this apparent dependency is conserved across multiple different forms of high-grade glioma, um, including pediatric GBM, diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma, both xenografted to the pons or to the cortex, adult GBM, but this dependency does not extend to a patient-derived model of breast cancer brain metastasis, suggesting that while this is a very important mechanism across multiple forms of um, glioma of primary brain cancers, this does not necessarily extend to brain metastases um, or other forms of brain cancer. So turning back to that optic pathway glioma model, um, we uh, wondered whether neuroligand 3 was also the key mechanism at play there. And we wondered this um, not only because of the role that it plays in high-grade gliomas, but because we noticed that in the NF1 mutant optic nerve, remember this is a tumor predisposition syndrome in which all the cells in the body have the NF1 mutation, we noticed that there was aberrantly increased neuroligand 3 shedding, um, suggesting that perhaps neuroligand 3 abundance in the tumor microenvironment or in the potential tumor microenvironment um, might be contributing to uh, the predisposition to develop tumors in that location in this uh, tumor predisposition syndrome. And so we tested that idea by crossing, simply crossing neuroligand 3 knockout mice to this NF1 optic pathway glioma mouse model. And what we found is that that phenocopied modulating visual experience. Um, if we leave these mice in normal light cycles with normal visual experience, they, in the absence of neuroligand 3, develop far fewer and much smaller tumors, suggesting that neuroligand 3 really is a key um, uh, mechanism modulating NF1-associated optic pathway glioma um, initiation here. But why is this such an important mechanism? Well, when neuroligand 3 is shed from um, the normal brain in an activity-dependent way, it binds to glioma cells and then quickly recruits uh, numerous oncogenic signaling pathways, including focal adhesion kinase, SARC, RAS, and PI3 kinase mTOR signaling. That helps explain the sufficiency of neuroligand 3 in promoting tumor proliferation, but it really doesn't explain this unexpected dependency. And so we dug a little deeper and looked at the gene expression changes attributable to neuroligand 3 binding. And what we found was that there was interestingly a, a number of synapse associated genes regulated by neuroligand 3 binding to the cancer cell. There's a feed forward effect of neuroligand 3 on its own expression together with upregulation of the BDNF receptor TREP B, but also a number of glutamate receptor subunits and other synapse associated structural proteins. And so this raised for us the possibility that, like there are synapses forming between neurons and healthy oligodendric glial precursor cells, there may also be synapses forming between neurons and glioma cells. And indeed, when we look by immunoelectron microscopy, where we can identify the malignant cell by immunogold labeling, there are these very clear synaptic structures. And testing the idea that neuroligand 3 might be playing a role in establishing these synaptic structures in the absence of neuroligand 3 from the tumor microenvironment, far fewer of these neuron to glioma synapses form. But are these truly a, a you know, functional kind of you know, cell communication uh, structure? Are these synapses electrophysiologically functional? Or are they just a shadow of the cell type from which these tumors emerge? So we um, tested this using whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology, patching um, the GFP labeled tumor cells xenografted, in, in this case, to a very experimentally tractable circuit, the hippocampus. Uh, recording from these cells um, while we stimulate the axonal afferents into this region. And then we can dye fill the cells at the end so we can go back and just make sure that we were in fact uh, patched onto a cancer cell and not a normal cell. And what we find when we do this experiment and record from the tumor cells while stimulating the axonal afferents into this region, 
is that a subpopulation of cells do indeed exhibit really clear excitatory postsynaptic currents. These depend upon action potentials. They're blocked by the voltage-gated sodium channel blocker to trototoxin. They exhibit uh, multiple electrophysiological characteristics of bona fide synapses, including paired pulse facilitation and single vesicle events called mini EPSCs. More specifically, this, this first kind of synapse that we identified in pediatric high-grade gliomas and then also Frank Winkler's group identified in adult high-grade gliomas is mediated by calcium permeable amperoceptors. Now, amperoceptors in the healthy brain, um, amperoceptor-mediated synapses exhibit mechanisms of adaptive plasticity. And we wondered whether that was at play here as well in these malignant synapses. One of the ways in which healthy synapses exhibit adaptive plasticity is mediated by uh, the glutamate receptor, um, NMDA. But it, it, interestingly, tumors don't seem to express NMDA receptors, not, not primary gliomas anyway. So another mechanism is mediated by BDNF. And we wondered whether BDNF um, might be promoting modulation of synaptic strain. And so here, when we um, record from glioma cells and expose them uh, to BDNF in, in a slice preparation, we see that the current evoked by glutamate is much larger um, uh, in the BDNF-treated uh, tumor cell than in the absence of BDNF. And this is mediated by tumor um, expression of the BDNF receptor TREC-B. If we CRISPR delete the TREC-B gene and TREC-2, then BDNF does not exert this effect on synaptic strength in the glioma cell. Summarizing in the interest of time, a lot of work, what we found is that BDNF signaling through CAM, CAM, uh, uh, K2 increases amperoceptor trafficking to the postsynaptic membrane in the glioma cell, augmenting the synaptic currents. We wondered whether there, have, there are other kinds of synapses as well, and, and noticed that there was fairly high expression of GABA receptor subunits in uh, diffuse uh, intrinsic pontine glioma and diffuse midline gliomas. Um, and so when we stimulate um, and, and isolate the GABAergic currents in these diffuse midline glioma cells, we find that there is a very clear GABAergic current blocked by the GABA-A receptor blocker picrotoxin, and that these GABAergic currents in the tumor cells are augmented uh, by uh, allosteric modulators of GABA-A, like benzodiazepines. GABA, we think of as a hyperpolarizing inhibitory neurotransmitter, but of course in neural stem cells and in immature neurons, GABA is instead depolarizing because of the um, uh, relative um, intracellular chloride concentrations in those cells. We find that in um, diffuse midline glioma cells, GABA is similarly depolarizing rather than hyperpolarizing. This is not true for adult glioblastomas, which do not express um, the same level of GABA-A receptors and do not exhibit these GABAergic currents. Again, just to confirm that the mechanism mediating the depolarizing effect of GABA is mediated by um, uh, known mechanisms of increasing intracellular chloride, we find that um, uh, these tumor cells express high levels of NKCC1 and that the intracellular chloride concentration in pediatric diffuse intrinsic pontine gliome is much higher than in adult glioblastoma. This suggests that GABAergic interneurons might be playing an important role here in the pediatric diffuse midline glioma tumor context. And so if we optogenetically uh, stimulate the activity of um, GABAergic interneurons, that indeed increases in vivo tumor proliferation. Now there's a third kind of current um, that we see in both pediatric and adult um, glial malignancies that's much longer in duration uh, than these synaptic currents. Rather than being on the millisecond time scale, these um, prolonged currents are more on the seconds time scale. And interestingly, they scale with field potential, meaning that the more neurons that are active of the larger and longer these prolonged currents are. And what we determine these represent are potassium evoked currents, much like normal astrocytes exhibit. Um, these can be elicited by potassium alone and are blocked by barium, which, which um, uh, inhibits potassium channels. Now we notice that in these uh, cells that exhibit the, the prolonged potassium evoked currents, that when we dye filled them to confirm that we were recording from a tumor cell, we saw that the biocytin dye actually diffused to a network of cells, not just to one cell. And that reminded us 
of really um, important results from Frank Winkler's lab showing that adult glioblastomas connect to each other through long microtubes and gap junctional coupling. And so we wondered, number one, whether this was also happening in pediatric glioma cells. We, we see these tumor microtubes and gap junctional coupling and wondered whether these gap junctions were serving not just to couple the cells together in a network, but actually serving to amplify these electrochemical currents. And we find that if we block gap junctions, either um, with, with, we use multiple different methods. Here I'm showing you data um, using a migraine medicine called meclofenamate. This decreases the amplitude of um, these potassium evoked currents. And so in summary, we're finding that these brain cancers integrate into the neural circuits that they invade. They do this synaptically through bona fide neuron to glioma synapses that are then elaborated and reinforced through mechanisms of adaptive plasticity as well as electrically through activity dependent potassium evoked currents that are amplified in the gap junction coupled network. That's a lot of different ways that glioma cells are exhibiting membrane depolarization. So we wondered whether the membrane depolarization alone uh, might be promoting tumor proliferation and growth. And, and that would make sense because we know that synchronous waves of membrane depolarization and consequent calcium transients are really important for normal brain development, that that um, is important for regulating prenatal stem cell and precursor cell proliferation um, in, the, in the developing brain. So we tested this idea again using optogenetics, this time using optogenetics um, to, to optogenetically depolarize glioma cells that we've engineered to express channel rhodopsin 2. And when we xenograph those cells to the mouse brain and deliver blue light, not to stimulate the neurons, but rather to depolarize directly the tumor cells, we find that this does increase glioma proliferation. Conversely, blocking uh, these mechanisms, such as blocking amperoceptor dependent synaptic signaling, either pharmacologically or as I'm showing you here genetically, has a stark growth inhibitory effect on the tumors. We can visualize uh, this electrical activity in the tumors um, using genetically encoded calcium indicators um, like gcamp success. Here I'm showing you the evoked um, calcium transients in a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma tumor. Uh, these depend upon neuronal activity. They're blocked by tetrodotoxin. And of course, we don't need to stimulate. There's much spontaneous neuronal activity um, in, in you know, acute uh, slices, for example. And here, this two-photon imaging movie of um, calcium transients, activity-dependent calcium transients in diffuse midline glioma, uh, I think really underscores what is, for me, a startling new understanding that this cancer is an electrically active tissue. And that's not how we have been approaching either understanding it or treating it. And so as a field, we really now need to understand the mechanisms of malignant circuit, assembly, plasticity, evolution over the disease course to understand what it is about membrane depolarization that promotes growth. What are these voltage sensitive mechanisms of proliferation? And I suggest that in understanding this about the brain cancers, that we will glean really important insights for normal neural development and plasticity viewed through the magnified lens of brain cancer. To summarize um, you know, what I've told you so far, and uh, you know, we know that neuronal activity is driving glioma proliferation and growth, both through paracrine um, growth factors regulated by neuronal activity, as well as through um, electrochemical mechanisms mediated by neuron to glioma synapses and potassium evoked currents. Those are then amplified in this glioma to glioma gap junction coupled network. It's not a unidirectional conversation though. It's not just that neurons promote glioma cell proliferation. Gliomas then promote neuronal hyperexcitability to sort of drive a malignant signaling um, loop between neurons and glioma cells. And gliomas increase neuronal excitability both by secreting uh, glutamate in a non-synaptic way, as well as by importantly secreting a variety of synaptogenic factors that increase neuron to neuron synapses probably as well as neuron to glioma synapses. Already we're beginning to see some potential targets for glioma therapy emerging from this emerging understanding of these interactions. We may be able to target neuroligin-3 cleavage and binding, AMPA receptor signaling, gap junctions, neurotrophin signaling, GABAergic signaling in the diffuse midline glioma specifically, 
potassium channels, and synaptogenic factors. And I think that the mechanistic parallels evident between normal and malignant neuron glial interactions really underscores the extent to which these cancers are simply hijacking mechanisms of normal neural development and demand that we begin to approach brain cancer from a neuroscience perspective. I want to conclude with the idea that, that approaching cancer from a neuroscience perspective is not at all limited to cancers of the central nervous system, but it's becoming really clear that this is a broad principle in cancer biology, that the nervous system, just as it regulates the um, uh, you know, normal tissue stem cell uh, niche in, in um, various organs throughout the body, just as it regulates normal organogenesis, uh, in, in tissues as, as in organs as diverse as the salivary gland, you know, to, to the prostate. Um, so too are interactions between the nervous system and cancer really, really important. There are electrochemical neural cancer interactions so far best described in uh, cancers that occur in the nervous system, both primary brain cancers and work from Doug Hanahan's uh, lab has shown that breast cancer brain metastases form perisynaptic structures um, and, and derive glutamatergic um, electrochemical signaling um, from that perisynaptic position. There are really important paracrine neural cancer interactions between peripheral nerves and tumors um, occurring in the prostate, the pancreas, the stomach, the colon, skin, breast. And I think as more cancers are studied, this list will only grow. And of course, there are critically important um, systemic interactions between the nervous system and cancers and a range of um, organs and tissues. Uh, we know that cancer it induces immune dysregulation. Uh, this is also, as we're increasingly understanding in the field, regulated by the nervous system. And the tumor also induces in important changes in sleep, mood, and cognition. I want to um, thank all of the people in my lab, past and present, our collaborators, funding sources, and last but not least, the patients and families whose donation of tumor tissue really enables all of the work that we do. Thanks so much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion portion. Thank you so much, Michelle. This was really, really amazing talk. Um, so maybe we can start off the discussion with a question from Asia, which she, which she added on the chat box. Uh, she says, wonderful talk. Do you have an idea whether some mechanisms will be similar between glioma and uh, metastasis? So... Um... Work that uh, has been done sort of collaboratively between my lab and Hamsa Venkatesh's new lab actually has uh, focused on uh, small cell lung cancer uh, growth in the brain. And there really does, for small cell lung cancer, seem to be um, really important growth promoting effects of cortical neurons. Um, the mechanisms seem to be very similar. Um, there, there seems to be both paracrine as well as synaptic interactions that are at play with multiple forms of neurons, both glutamatergic and GABAergic. So I do think that, um, you know, as we study different brain metastases, while the mechanisms may be distinct between different tissue types, um, it, metastases arising from different tissue types, that many of these same um, interactions are going to be at play. Okay, amazing. Okay, so we have a second question coming in from... Raziela Di Cristo, a very inspiring talk. Is it known if specific GABAergic cell types target gliomal cells? Mm -hmm. This is such a great question. So um, I am very interested in understanding this. We have so far tested um, GABAergic interneurons in the hippocampus um, tar using a DLX promoter, so kind of broadly targeting um, interneurons. Um, I, I have noticed that tumors tend to grow very quickly when they're in the cerebellum, which has a, a number of different GABAergic neuronal cell types. And we're trying right now to understand um, how those different cell types interact with tumors when they occur in or spread to the cerebellum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another question from Carlos Ribeiro. Fantastic talk. Your work opens the space of glioma treatment to consider modulation of neuronal activity. Is it realistic? And if yes, what are your thoughts on how that could be implemented? Yeah, so um, 
one potential therapy, you know, avenue for therapeutic modulation is by targeting specific neurotransmitter receptors and, and ion channels. And we've been doing um, uh, sort of medium throughput screens to understand which drugs of neurology and psychiatry and cardiology might be repurposed in this way. Um, it does seem that those drugs that target, you know, very specific interactions, um, the, the particular neurotransmitters at play, those expressed by the glioma cells seem to be the most effective rather than broadly targeting uh, neuronal activity. Um, but another way that we might modulate this activity is, is through, you know, neurosurgical neuromodulation by actually um, like deep brain stimulation um, to, to drive disadvantageous patterns or frequencies of activity. And we've been trying to play in different patterns and frequencies of neuronal activity to see if there are those that differentially drive the tumor or inhibit tumor growth. Um, so we've been doing those optogenetic experiments. There's still ongoing, but our hope is that we can identify a way to use uh, functional neurosurgical approaches, you know, optimized and individualized for each patient and its growth pattern within neural circuitry um, to, to try to inhibit tumor growth. So more to come on that. It's, it's a really, um, that, that idea is a little further from, you know, clinical implementation, whereas, you know, reusing, repurposing drugs that we know to be safe and use for things like seizures, um, it's probably a little closer to clinical implementation, but yeah, that, that goes on. actually in the lines of one question that I wanted to ask you regarding your, uh, optogenetic, uh, activation of neurons and then how that, you know, acts on, uh, glioma, uh, cells to proliferate. So have you tried like you know, different frequency of activation or intensities of activation and how does that impact on the proliferation? Yeah, so um, it does seem that patterns of optogenetic stimulation or strategies that evoke more robust depolarization. So the, the amount of depolarization matters. Um, it's not just depolarization. And, and that kind of goes along with why, you know, we think that this malignant synaptic plasticity matters, stronger currents, um, leaving the light on for longer, for example, and, and, and allowing more cations to go into the glioma cell, that promotes growth more robustly than um, uh, less optogenetic stimulation, either lower frequency or um, shorter light pulses. Um, so we're, we're trying to understand the principles of, of, of the depolarization that matters, but it may be that there are um, frequencies that can, can inhibit growth as well. And we're, we're hoping to... Um, you know, identify those optogenetically. Okay, so we have another question from Zara Corgay uh, asking, um, saying, first of all, amazing talk. I had a question about your optic glioma experiment. While yeah. tumors were mitigated, uh, were there any effects on visual behaviors following dark rearing in this yeah. mice at this critical development period? This could affect perhaps using visual experience as a treatment approach for specific conditions. Yeah, it's a great question. One thing that we were very um, cognizant of was actually not dark rearing the mice until their visual systems had entirely developed. So we don't start until six weeks of age in any of the experiments at the earliest time point. Um, because certainly dark rearing during the critical period in the early postnatal period does influence um, opto, you know, visual pathway development in really important ways that could be lasting. Um, so you know, monitoring, for example, um, you know, retinal electrophysiology, we didn't see any kind of decrement in um, visual function. We looked at the number of retinal ganglion cells and, and saw no change um, actually, that the tumors impair retinal ganglion cell health. And so in the mice that were dark reared and therefore had tumors that were either prevented or very small, uh, we were able to preserve retinal ganglion cell health in a way that, that normally doesn't happen in the presence of the tumors. Um, so we, we don't think that we, in this context, impaired um, visual system development or um, uh, you know, influenced the, you know, visual function after this period of dark rearing. In terms of, you know, thinking about how to do this clinically, it, it is a really important question what the threshold of visual experience modulation needs to be. We're certainly not going to take kids with NF1 and put them in the dark, right? That's not an option. But could we potentially avoid, you know, visual stimulation with screens during an important, you know, developmental period? Could we filter light to some extent, you know, is, is filtering blue light an, enough to, to decrease activity enough that it 
um, uh, decreases the risk of tumor development. Those are experiments actually that are ongoing. We'd like to understand what the threshold is um, because there are some behavioral modifications, uh, lifestyle modifications that one could recommend for very high risk children who are at, you know, high risk during a particular period of childhood develop these tumors, not dark rearing, but maybe glasses um, oh. and not iPads. <laughs> so <laughs> those are things we're, we're testing. We don't know the answer. Fantastic. Um, so another question from Aden. Thank you for the excellent talk, uh, Dr. Monji. Uh, is there any idea as to how abnormal neural, neural circuits contribute to pathogenesis and seizure formation in radiation necrosis? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the, the short answer is that I don't know. Um, you know, there are um, really detrimental effects of some of our therapies and radiation necrosis is one extreme example of how our therapies can damage normal neural circuits and normal tissue. Um, and, and I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know how, um, the way that the tumor is influencing, you know, neural circuit remodeling, which it does do, um, you know, contributes to the functional output after functional outcomes after radiation necrosis. But it's a really interesting question. Okay, so so everybody's saying wonderful talk. Thank you, thank you for your discussion. So I think maybe we we close the session of today. Um, thank you so much for joining everybody. Um, and please do not miss our next uh, week's seminar from Dr. Sun Yeon Kim, joining us from Seoul uh, National University. And he will tell us about neural, neural circuits for behavioral regulation of homeostasis. So I, I, can, I count you all to be uh, joining us uh, next week. I also thank um, Professor Monji for, for being with us today. And maybe if, we, you know, if people can, uh, which are interested, uh, 